Hi, everybody. Hi, I'm Fanny Shelly Greenland, and I am um, an animal I also work with um, training dogs, I work with behavior modification, and I'm also teaching a pet care technician class at a private career school for individuals with disabilities. So we do a lot of different stuff. Um, I want to talk to you about something that I know that you're going to tell me. Um, you already know. And we're from New York, right? We're New Yorkers. We all know how to walk dogs. We don't back your dogs unless we're really, really lucky. But most of us have to take our dogs out for a walk. So they don't get to use the toilet at home either, right? So they've got to get out there, they've got to pee, they've got to poo. But the question is, what are you doing when you're taking that dog out? Is it just about getting that dog out for a walk? Or is it about um, then letting that dog actually process information, get some exercise? I know. So we'll, then we'll take them for a run, right? But really, what your dog wants to be doing when he's outside, he really wants to be sniffing around. That's really, really what they want to do. And believe it or not, a good sniff around the block is going to make your dog much more tired than a run around the block. Because they have to process all this incredible information. Um, so, I put this up here from John Bradshaw, and I think it's really worth reading because it's really very, very important. We're, we do not process information the same way as dogs do. We are visual. It's all about for us, the eyes, we're primates. Our dogs are not. So their primary sense is the sense of smell. That's how they process information. They look at us. It's amazing how they co-evolve with us so that they can actually look at us for things and communicate with us that way. But really, how they're seeing the world is through their noses. So they're not just using odor to decide what to eat or not. It's their primary way of identifying people. It's their dominant sense, one that they use in preference to all their other senses whenever they can. And they have the hardware for this as well. They have a sensitivity to odors that's 10,000 to 100,000 times more sensitive than our owners. That's a lot. So when we don't let our dogs sniff when they get outside, it's like my taking you out and putting my hands over your eyes. You're not going to get to see anything. So this part of the brain that they have, this olfactory cortex, is actually 40 times greater than ours. They have hundreds of times more nerves. The, the tissue that lines their um, nose, this epithelial tissue that's on the inside, is so rich with all these nerves in order to be able to protect the So you want to let your dogs in out there and you want to sniff. With, or let them sniff. Let them sniff. You don't, you don't have to do any sniffing. And you also want to avoid Dog driving. Right. So sometimes with our guys, we work out there with them. We don't even realize that they're sniffing. So the idea of letting them do enough sniffing um, so that they can actually experience where it is that they are. And then when you want to go forward with them, give them a chance. Let them know that you want to move forward. And he blocks the door. So what I say sometimes is really a good thing, and I know you're like, well, my dog doesn't understand, they don't want to do this, they don't want to do that. But if you ask them to go forward, they're sniffing, it's time to move along. Certainly when I talk about this sniffing, you don't want this sniffing if your dog is seeing another dog in the middle of the of Lennox. Because that happens to me sometimes too. I'm like, no, we got to go now. Right? Not a good place to, to have that kind of interaction. So you then want to at least cue your dog that you would like to move forward. Ask for it. And even whether your dog understands the exact words, they will pick up a lot on your attention movement. They're going to pick up a lot on your tone of voice. And if you ask the dog to move forward, and then you move forward, a lot of the times they'll go with you. What happens a lot of the time is we do this, but we just saw the next slide. So we ask the dog to move, and then we stand and we look at him. He's not listening to me because you're standing there still again, but what you're doing is keeping him in place when that's happening, right? So, oh, another thing. What they sniff means different things, right? So we get upset sometimes because that butt sniffing is disgusting. We think. But a butt sniff is just a butt sniff. 
It really is one of the best ways for these dogs to get to know each other, okay? So actually when you talk about introducing dogs to each other, dogs that don't know each other, there's a thing we do we call linear line walking, where they're going to sniff the butt of the other dog on a walk, and it's a great way for them to get to know each other. And you ever see a shy dog sometimes? You're walking the dog, oh my dog doesn't like other dogs. And then as you walk past the other dog, he kind of turns around and tries to get a sniff in the other dog. Because he wants to know, get to know that dog. So this butt sniffing is really very, very important for them as ways to get to know each other. It doesn't have a sexual connotation for it. And it's also not a, um, about sniffing poop or sniffing pee when it comes to that kind of stuff that is disgusting in, uh, to us in that way. For a dog, it's really about all kinds of information. And that is very inspiring for, for uh, dog walking. If you want to get your dog to eliminate quicker, let him sniff. It's very, very, very inspiring. Very it's fabulous, fabulous thing for them to be able to do. So um, they use this uh, P-mail as tremendous communication. They're picking up all kinds of information about each other. And dogs do what's called overmarch. So if there's Urine that's there, they want to deposit their own urine on top of it. Even the females will do this, okay? Cats don't do this. Your, your uncastrated male cats, your tongue cats who are using urine as communication, they want their own space to urinate. So if they're out there spraying, they're going to find a different place. It's true, right? Cats, cats don't um, overmark what dogs do. So really knowing that they want to sniff everything, again, letting them sniff that, important stuff. Okay. So, because it's New York, um, except for this guy, he's like a big in Hawaii or something. But wanted to just ask you about some of these pictures and ask you what's wrong with this one. I'm going to start with my favorite one. It's, you know, you just ran into the um, supermarket, right? You just want to get in and out and grab something. So not necessarily such a great thing to do when we're walking our dogs. And I don't know if you know this, but in 2011, New York City passed an anti-tether law. So if you leave your dog tied outside for more than 20 minutes without food or water, you're actually breaking the law. I do. Yes, absolutely the truth. And, and not more than three hours in a 24-hour period. There's all kinds of, and we're kind of backwards in when we did it because other cities had done it way before that. So yeah, so do, we do have some regulations with regard to this, um, so not for more than 20 minutes. You also cannot be walking your dog on a leash that is longer than six feet. That's also against the, the law. So the, those, and then, yeah, then where's the enforcement, right? There's also, there's also fines for picking up, not picking up after your dog, right? So we don't have, well, that works, especially when there's okay. snow on the ground. Yeah. And people yeah. aren't doing that. Right? So the Department of Health, the Department of Sanitation, who is responsible really for being the ones who are going to ticket you for that kind of stuff, mostly you don't get tickets. And um, having your dog off leash, we have a leash law, is also against the law in the city of New York. And um, they, you can get fined for that as well. So, and I don't accept it. We do know there are parts of the, of the park where you can have your dog off leash before nine or after nine. What tends to happen is people know, and, you know, where you, after a while, you know, we know the restaurants we can go to with our dogs, right, that we're not supposed to. We know the places we can like, let our dogs off leash even though we're not supposed to. And so um, one time I was out walking my dog and this woman had her dog off leash and she said to me, I did the same thing. She said, be careful, I just got a ticket the other day. I, I said, really? She said, yeah. So she said, yeah, I saw the guy coming. He was at the bottom of the hill. This is in Riverside Park. I'm going back a couple of years. But I saw the guy coming. The dog was off the leash. He took him all That dog, that one time, she wouldn't come back to me. I was like, yeah, that's why he gave you the ticket, because you couldn't, you didn't have the dog under control to have him on the leash. So yeah, so we do have some laws in New York City. Speaking about no leash, that's what's wrong with that picture. Obviously, I don't care how great I think I am when it comes to having my dog under control. If it comes to a squirrel, all bets are probably going to be off, right? So good idea for you really to have your dog on the leash. And um, to be, this and this is adorable. He's got this big dog. He's got this little dog, but not very much control over what's going on with that. This is one of my favorite things when you see this. Um, is he friendly? 
you know, and that we just hold them close enough so that they can almost touch, but they can't. And it really, if you're doing um, attack dog training, the way you induce that kind of reaction is to hold the dog close enough to something, but within, but without him being able to get it. It's incredibly frustrating. So these dogs cannot interact with each other. Either let them sniff each other or move along with it and then move those dogs in. If they can interact, they can interact. And you, you people say, ask me, well, how do you know? First of all, you know what your dog looks like when your dog is friendly, right? And you know what your dog looks like when he's stressed or when she's stressed. So you definitely can pick up on those cues. Another thing too with this is cross-gender is always a safer way to go with that. Um, so if I have a, a female dog, I, my first question is, is it, okay, is it okay to say hi and is he a boy? Because if he's a boy, usually it's gonna, it'll work just fine that way. So that's, that's something, and the co-handling that's true too. Okay, so I'm gonna, so um, that's a prong collar, right? And this guy's got a shock on him, and this little French bulldog is just a buckle collar. So most of the time with these buckle collars, especially with these flatter face breeds, you really want to put them into some kind of a harness. Let me just grab my harness back here. Because that's going to take the pressure off of their throats. And a lot of these guys are just going to keep pulling, and it's going to be harder than the smaller dogs to no uh, buckle collar. So putting them into something where you know you can attach that where the, the point of pulling is going to be more on the chest or even on the uh, on the back. This is a, this is a sensation. It's a no pull harness, which is a great harness, but not necessarily. Sometimes with some of the shorter ones, he's got long enough legs. He's got. He's got. He was good. Um, these prong collars um, are not, again, the necessarily the best things for us to be using. I know that years ago people were all about use the child, use the prong. Great collars for you to be able to work with. You're going to teach them not to pull. What tends to happen is the dog pulls anyway, especially if they want something. Um, they habituate to it, they get used to it, and then you end up getting a lot of damage too with the shoulders, back, neck, you know, all kinds of problems with them. Um, shock collar, same type of deal. We're talking about punishment to get the dogs to stop going forward and do something. It's really hard when it comes to working with those kinds of devices. First of all, it's all about the timing. If you are not shocking this dog, um, the second that it is doing what you don't want it to do, you're not teaching it anything. Um, punishment is not really that great in terms of being affected scientifically anyway, they habituate to it, you get displacement behavior, and the dog is afraid of you. So not necessarily the best thing. And what tends to happen with these guys too is like the dog runs away, he comes back to you, and then you're like, oh, did you leave? Displacement of behavior is, is when they yawn, right? Well, you get, when you tell them to do something, they yawn? Well, okay, so yawning is, is, a, is, stre is a stress behavior. So you would see lip licking out of the context of eating, yawning out of the context of being tired. Okay, turning away, you know, that kind of thing. Those are some of the stress signals. Displacement might behavior would be, I start to punish your dog, and all of a sudden, um, he's gonna start urinating in the house. So you take, you're adding in another behavior that you hadn't had before as a result of that. Yeah, because I know the honey you know, to have a right, I would, Take him and I would ask him, my like, command yeah, that he knew, and he didn't want to do it at the time he would yawn. He would yawn. Okay. Yeah. So yeah, he wasn't tired. But that, right? He wasn't tired. So, but that was more, that he was stressed by your asking us to do something he didn't want to do. Yeah, that's exactly. Yeah. So what about this? Can you see that little dog? Very, very, very not that, not that well. Does he? If you can see him, does he look happy? So what is, and that lady looks like she really likes him. She would have been better scooching down his morning. Thank you, she would have been better going to, and she would have been better to coming to him from the side. So we kind of do this thing as primates, right? We want to go right up to the dog. But dogs don't do this with each other. They kind of, sometimes they'll do this T thing, but mostly it's this linear, they're they approaching that dog from the side, 
and then going down and then kind of allowing him to sniff my hand would have been much better. And you really see this when you, when you go into their faces and into their spaces. That's when you can, you'll see this turning, lip licking, all these kinds of behaviors where even if they submit to it, they don't really like it, okay? I don't know if that gets hot, like the country. Oh, yeah, well that, that's a hot place for really. you. So here, these guys have um, halters on, these body halters, and different kinds of them. And even this little guy's got one on them. He's, this guy has, um, you can see back there, he's got some kind of a halter on him. So I talk a lot about using the right kind of equipment when you're walking the dog, but the biggest thing that you, the biggest piece of equipment you have is what? It's yourself. Right? It's how are you walking your dogs. So I talked about using a shorter leash, which is really important. And about here, here you've got someone who's coming to the side with this dog and is allowing that sit. When it comes to walking your New York City dog, one thing that we do know about is we have all kinds of obstacles. This is not New York City. You've got kids on um, scooters, people riding on bicycles, people with kids running up to your dog, skates, people on the phone. There's just 500 million different things that you have to navigate. But right. not to mention the sidewalk surfing, right? What, what uh, garbage, garbage, everything is going on. And our own level of being distracted when it comes to walking our dogs. Whether, you know, you're trying to um, make the light, your phone just rang, you're late for work, you can see that dog come out, there's all different kinds of things. But you only have your own self. So you know the level of reactivity of your dog, hopefully. And I know sometimes people will say, well, you know, if I can, I'll just turn and I'll walk the other way, or I'll go between a parked car, or I'll cross the street. And that's all great. But the one thing you should realize that you always have is you have yourself, and you have yourself as a barrier, you have yourself as social support. So if you don't and you can't do that kind of thing, the best thing for me to be able to do, um, a slip loop, which is not. But the best thing for me to be able to do with this dog is for me to literally just put myself on the other side of whatever it is that's going on, right? And I'm not, and not to move the don't you, not to move Annie, but I'm really going to just move me. It's much easier if I just step behind the dog and now I'm on the other side. And at the same time, shorten your leash. And I don't mean shorten leash pull the dog. Shorten leash literally means the leash that you have in your hand wants the dog. The leash that you have in your hand, you're going to shorten it here, keeping it at your solar plexus, and then just take your hand down, okay? I've just shortened my leash. I shorten my leash by keeping my leash closer to my body. I didn't do anything to this dog. But now, the shorter the leash, P.S., the more control you have, the more secure the dog is, the more the dog is going to be responsive to you. So if I've got this dog coming, the first thing I have to do is really kind of put myself between me and him. Guess what? I'm cutting down a lot on that, both for this dog and for my dog. So we got a not as pleased to the dog. <laughs> he likes stuffed animals. He loves I see that. <laughs> so. But you, we got a little bit of it coming down when I kind of stood in between. <laughs> but that's exactly what we're talking about, is that if you can do that, if you can actually step, um, putting your, I, and I can't say this enough, I do this with kids all the time. You know the kids that don't, that no one told you have to ask me to pet your dog? My, I just keep yeah. running up to the dog. If you kind of just, sometimes I'll stand in front of the dog with those kids, and you'll just do, watch with the kids, and some of them, they're like, Okay, it's not going to happen that time. And then they kind of just back off from what it is that's happening. But using your body and putting it in between something and doing it in such a way that you're, oh, P.S., when I say use yourself, you have to be breathing and calm, right? <laughs> if you're starting to be nervous or excited about this, that leash then becomes this incredible lightning rod for the unscared. Kind of thing, and then your dog is going to react to that too. So, this handling, this being, this moving, and shortening the leash, just doing all this other stuff. Take a deep breath. If you do feel that way, and you know, every, if I'm working with someone, I don't care who it is, 
I think it's even better before I walk into their apartment because I really want to be calm. And I want that dog that's in there to not pick up on the fact that, you know, he, they, he has a history of, uh, of mauling. I'm working with a couple right now where it's, it's about fighting and believing. I did a lot of debriefing before I walked in because I don't know that dog, especially when I never met the dog. I have no idea. And he doesn't, he has no me. So I really want to be as mellow as possible and believe me, turn to the side and do all these other things. So, other questions? I have two things. Um, I've got a large dog, American Bulldog, 93 pounds. Um, I do try to let him have his time to sniff. However, my dog likes to eat poop. Okay. That's a problem, right? Because you don't want him to eat poop. No. Has he always been doing this? Since he came to New York, because it's more abundant here, uh, he likes to uh, eat. So, so when it comes to, it's actually a term uh, called, yes. called carophagia, which is, uh, it's, it's not a natural behavior for them to do it. So we don't, it could be any number of reasons why they're doing it. Sometimes they'll say dietary deficiency. Sometimes they just do it because they like it. And I talk about cat poo because most dogs will eat cat poo. It's like Tootsie Rolls. Yes, because the cat diet has more protein in it. So that's kind of what they're going for is they're going for more of, the, of whatever residual protein is left or whatever's left in the, in the food. He's on a special diet right now for food allergies where he's getting his limited diet because when I, he's a rescue when I first got yeah. him, he broke out. Since I've had him on that diet, his skin is doing much better. But is the poo eating is increasing? When he, with his terms of eating the poop, it's not increasing. As far as I can tell, but he really likes to eat poop, so it's hard for us. So did he always eat the poop? I moved him to New York, so it's a different situation right, so because he was in a completely different environment right. where there weren't other dogs who shat where he was walking. Right. No, I hear what you're saying. I'm talking when I'm talking when you say he's on a different diet. I wonder, and that's something that's to, to figure out if the diet has anything to do with him wanting to eat the poop. Number one, yeah. number two, but then to manage it from the behavior. Then, then you're right. If he's, if he's going to be eating feces, you don't want that. That's not very healthy for him, right? So you have to, that, that tasks you with having to manage him all the time and not to allow him to be able to do that. This is a big dog, so it's hard for you to move away from this once he starts to go for it. Kind of targets and falls, yeah. kind of a thing. So I try, to, I try to give him the opportunity to sniff, and when he comes across it, I will say no. But sometimes, it, like if it's something that he likes, he'll, he'll go for it. He forces himself. So at that point, you know what? Though really, I mean, you've got a management issue. You've got to manage the behavior first before you can even um, start to work with modifying it. I would let him sniff urine. And when it comes to, if you see that coming up ahead, and this is it's a problem in New York because where you want him to eliminate is where exactly he's going to be sniffing. Yeah. But looking for those areas or those tree pits where there's going to be less feces and then letting him sniff around there. And then the other stuff, I would literally move myself so it kind of block him from yeah. being able to see it and managing it that way. Try to avoid that. Because yes, he does need to sniff. There are uh, there are some blocks that have more um, deposits on them than others. And there's some blocks that he loves to go down. Yes, uh, right. But then maybe he yeah. can't do that for a while. Maybe until, I don't need to, it, it's, it's difficult, and I would even, want to know, I would ask about that diet, ask um, your vet, or maybe this is something. I don't know with that. It's an interesting question. Yeah. But if that's a behavior that just came in and has nothing to do with the diet, then it's hard to say because yeah. his environment has changed. Yes. No, no, I hear you. I yeah. hear you. But, but from, from a health standpoint, just to avoid to, you can snip all the, the walls and corners and trees that have urine that are on them, but when it comes to this, we're gonna, you can only snip at the tree pits or the places where there's less, and you just can't go down those blocks. And that means, because he's, until, and then work on perhaps training him or redirecting him from yeah, not doing it. But the bottom line is he can't, he is not the dog, that right now, if he's eating it, can sniff it. Yeah, because he wants to eat it. Yeah, and this poor, yeah, the two and I don't know if he can sniff 
a little bit and then try to redirect it with the tweet or something. I don't know if you can do that. I don't know how hard he's pulling to get it or how much, like, does he just like eat it right away or? It's pretty quick. Yeah. No, then, then yes. No, seriously, you gotta ask this question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is there a process? Does he think about it? Does he deliberate? Is it like a Some of some of them he deliberate depending on what kind it is. But he'll deliberate which one some some of them he goes right. right. Yeah. No, I hear it. He's a big boy, so when, big when he wants something he gets it. And it's the other thing, I do use a buckle collar with him that has an extra loop so it'll tighten, but there's You're a limit. Using a but there's a limit to how much it tightens. Yeah, so Mark, yeah. yeah, you. I would put him in. And you know what? I I put him in a harness. The thing about the harness. The thing about the harness is that all of the strength is in his chest. Yeah, but you're gonna put him in a noble harness. Yeah, easy. Well, not necessarily an easy one. I have. A, See these no, the no the no pull harness and and um how is he short legs or is it long legs? Yes. Yes. Yeah. So then he would do well in a sensation. So like with the sensation, um, this should be me, right? But um, an easy walk. I don't like the difference. Some of them salt is a little sensational. That's what he's calling it. Yeah, but he's not that. So here, so what the deal is, and you. I would take him out of that steadily. But the, the deal um, with this is that he, it's going to be moving him with his chest. And here it attaches in the front. So it is, it's attaching. Yeah. So you're moving him this way. This is a no pole harness. I have that. I'll try it again. But uh, because we, especially with your pullers, your big dogs. Yeah. And these brackets of Alex, you really want to try not to, if he's got that flatter face, not to have anything around his neck. All right. And pulling, let me tell you another thing about pulling. Two, think about the pulling. The more the dog pulls, and the more you pull against him, the more he has to pull to stand straight. Pulling is reinforces pulling. It's yeah. a, it is an oppositional reflex. If I pulled on you, you have to pull forward to stand up. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So putting these dogs into these kinds of things and then we're like, he's pulling, I'm pulling back. Um, you can also do like this red light, green light thing, which no one ever wants to do because it takes forever to get down the street, all right? And your timing has to be incredibly ex exquisite. So when I'm talking about red light, green light is he pulls, you stop. The second he lets up on the pulling, you take a step forward, okay? Yeah. This, and the second he pulls you some. But then you're also talking about um, this kind of, it must, you, you can't fault the dog if your timing is not right on with that. And so that's why you can just, just start with this. Um, something that's a, a, that's a no pull for these guys when they have that tremendous strength because they're pulling, pulling, pulling. Oh. 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 Sorry about that. Anything else? Okay. Thank you. Thank so you.